Okay, so I'm very happy to have a guest lecturer here today, Yan Chao Sun, uh, who's been working with me on reinforcement learning. She's apparently, uh, she knows, you know, definitely more about re deep reinforcement learning than I do. So hopefully, you know, today if we have more questions, Yan Chao will be here to answer them. Um, and, you know, uh, also, if for those of you who are interested in doing reinforcement learning research, um, you know, feel free to talk to Yan Chao online or offline. Okay, so today thank is you. the, yeah, thank you for being here. <clears throat> so today is the last lecture um, of the entire course, uh, but I, like I promised, I will be um, having a summary kind of, uh, you know, asynchronous summarization of the entire lecture, uh, which will be uploaded later. Um, so this may be count as the second last lecture, but it was really the last time I will be seeing you on Zoom for the semester. Um, so that means that don't forget to use the last week to um, work on your presentation. And please, you know, also check uh, you know, the presentation from other groups, uh, especially if the research topic is interesting to you, please feel free to post questions to them, ask them, uh, have discussions with them and so on. Okay, so really, I hope this lecture, so, you know, although we couldn't meet each other, but ho I really hope that people can talk to each other and somehow establish collaboration if possible. Okay, so let me continue the discussion today, lecture. So we talked about, you know, value-based methods for uh, deep reinforcement learning. So now it will be a policy gradient algorithms. And Yan Chao contributed a lot on the slides. So I wanted to thank her, uh, have a special thank, thank, thank you to her. Um, and so for policy gradient algorithms, you know, we learned about policy approximation you know, using some kind of uh, um, function to approximate the policy, right? Um, <clears throat> we learn about that, we learn about reinforce. Today we'll first review that, um, and then we'll see how deep uh, policy networks, you know, make adjustments to that, but really the adjustment is too trivial and you'll see soon. So just a recap of what we've already learned. Policy pi is an, uh, so now <laughs> instead of, a Gibbs policy or whatever other parameterized policy you have a neural network, um, you know, so it's a neural network parameterized uh, using the omega, now omega also in Rn, and being the number of um, weights in your neural network. So you can, again, denote it by pi as omega. So like I already, you know, like we already said before, the performance measure could just be, you know, they accumulated uh, reward, uh, accumulated discounted rewards or the value at the initial state. So you can see in this case, you can just look at the expectation of at the initial state as zero following a pi policy parameterized by the omega. Okay. So now, um, you know, in order to do the update, like we said, policy gradient. So you're just taking gradient with respect to a policy parameter. Therefore, you can update the parameter, and this is update rule, right? Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen here. Uh, oh, okay. So, and then the policy, the, so the gradient, as we said before, is given by the policy gradient theorem, right? So uh, it turns out it becomes the uh, discount factor. So actually, late in some of the slides today, we'll sometimes uh, see that we didn't see the gamma parameter discount factor, but you know if that's the case, then we're just assuming the gamma being one. So okay, so this discounting factor with the return and the uh, gradient of the logarithm pi. So we know why this is the logarithm. We talked about it when we talk about reinforce. So this is is essentially the reinforce algorithm, but for a neural network policy. You can see the only difference really is just the policy. Instead of using a Gibbs policy or kind of other parameter policy, you use a neural network. And that's about it, right? So that's 
the only difference between a reinforce in traditional sense and reinforce for neural network policy. Okay. All right, so this is a quick summarization of what we already learned about the reinforce. So now, so let's introduce, I guess, you know, the first more advanced, more advanced algorithms for policy-based methods in deep reinforcement learning is the so-called advantage actor critic. So advantage actor critic A to C, right? So, so basically this is motivated by um, the fact that policy gradient could have high variance. So, so they propose to use an advantage function. So let's first see the slide Yan Chao prepared for us to understand why could have policy gradient could have high variance. So specifically here, I wanted to mention that instead uh, of theta, for... yeah. Sorry, also are you using the slides? I'm not sure whether it's just the problem of my computer, but I can't see that. Uh, I can see your screen, but it's uh, on slide 25. I'm not sure whether the uh, same thing happens for others. Oh, is that, is that also true for others? Hmm. Uh, I'm oh. showing the A to C. OK, or... then let me rejoin the meeting. Sorry. OK, what about others? Can you can you see my screen well? Uh, yes. Are you seeing slide five? Yeah, I'm seeing advantage actor. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's just Yan Chao is seeing it differently. Anything, anyone else seeing it differently? Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm back. No, it's okay. fine. Okay. You can see. Okay. Awesome. Right. So, so here the slide is, you know, why does the policy gradient method have high variance? Uh, let me. Yeah, let me show you the slide here. So, you know, um, so actually in our conventional notation, we use omega to do the parameterization, but Yan Chao here is using omega. So this tau here is a trajectory, right? So when you evaluate the variance, you evaluate your policy gradient methods based on different trajectory. So here Yan Chao is showing that if you have three trajectories, of course you can have more, right? Let's just use three. So then with the three trajectories, if you were able to calculate with respect to you know, your, your, your methods, whatever setting it is, if you were able to get such a gradient of logarithm of pi, so you somehow evaluated it, and this is what you're getting. Of course, you, know, you might wonder why, but let's just pretend that this is the case. And then you are also getting the accumulated reward, so like the return being this form, okay? So that's very possible, right? So it depends on the reward model. If you have accumulated a lot of rewards, then of course you, your return could be high. And in this case, it's a thousand, a thousand and one, and a thousand and two. Doesn't seem to be very different, right? Looking at the three different accumulator reward. But if you calculate the variance of the product of the two terms, remember, you know, for uh, policy, so go back. For reinforce, you have to do the product of the two. So actually, let me not just go back. Yeah, you have to do the product. So if you look at the variance of the product of the two over the three different trajectories, you will see it has a very high variance, right? It's 23,000. It's very high. This is really bad, right? So what? You know, based on this observation, let's now think about a trivial case, or think about a simple trick, which is if we reduce all the values of these trajectories by a constant, right? So relatively, I didn't make any changes, you know, and it shouldn't matter. But if you just, you know, reduce the values by a constant, you know, say as 1001, then you can see it becomes the variance becomes 0 0.1633. So you can see this huge difference between the two. And really what we're doing is just making sure that the values of the um, of these trajectories are small or you know, const minus a constant, right? So 
So, so based on this motivation, actually we talked about the advantage function here. So, so, so this is the motivation of the advantage function. If you look at the A, it is a function with respect to ST and AT, like I said last time. So, you know, you would have, um, oh, are people asking questions on chat? Okay. Uh, okay, so Yan Chao is already answering them. So if, so do I need to do anything else or? Fine, we're fine. Okay, cool. So advantage function, right? So like I said, it's gonna be Q S T A T minus V S T, right? So the V S T is following a certain policy pi, where the Q S T A T is instead of following pi, I wanted to follow A T at step S T. So this is the so-called advantage function. Hopefully, by choosing A T, I could get a difference between the value. And that value, the difference is going to be my advantage. Of course, advantage could be positive or negative. Okay. So if you think about a you know simple the Bellman equation kind of thing, then you can write this Q S T A T as R T plus one plus gamma V S T plus one, right? In expectation, they should be the same. So so like Yan Chao is saying here, this is how better an action is compared to the others at a given state. Okay, so A to C basically, you know, is a very simple idea. It's using the advantage function in this actor critic framework we learned before. So, you know, so you just let the critic learn A instead of S. Okay, so that's all. And essentially, if you replace that, you can see the gradient, the policy gradient now, instead of being the previous form, it has this form. So replace that with the A. Okay, so, so basically the result can be, you can see that it will reduce the high variance of policy networks and stabilize the model. Uh, shouldn't the subscript of Q be V? Uh, uh, yeah, here uh, we use another network to parameterize the Q. Right. And uh, yeah, typically we use different networks for Q and V. But yeah, absolutely, you can use the same network for them, just use different tests. Yeah, this I, actually, I guess the notation is a little bit confusing. These are the parameterization of these networks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, so but the idea is really simple, right? So you're just replacing it with the advantage function instead of the Q function. Okay. All right. So this is the advantage actor critic A to C. Now, you know, one step further, you can have this asynchronous advantage actor critic A to A3C. So what is it? It's essentially just multiple independent agents at different environments. You can see the figure on the right hand side, right? You have N such environments. You can have such a you know advantage actor critic for each of the worker, but somehow you take an average over the worker in terms of doing the training. Okay, so it's an ensemble kind of learning, and essentially you're doing them you know simultaneously. Therefore, you, they can do things. You know, it's, it's like doing things in parallel, and this way you can save a lot of computation. So, like you know, the slide is saying here. So. A3C consists of multiple independent agents or the networks with their own weights and who interact with a different copy of the environment in parallel, right? So the results essentially can show uh, they can explore a bigger part of the state action space in much less time, okay? So this is again a, I guess, pretty empirical kind of, a, you know, trick that they use to improve the advantage actor critic. But you know, I guess the result seems to be very promising. Okay, so now here another method, which is also very popular uh, in deep policy uh, networks, is the deep deterministic policy gradient (DDPG). So DDPG is proposed in 2016, um, and it is an off-policy algorithm. Right, so I wouldn't have a lot of time talking into the details of it, but so essentially the idea is is kind of an actor critic framework, but with a DQN, so the deep Q network, right? So can 
be used for environments uh, with continuous action space um, and it can be thought of as being deep Q uh, learning for continuous action space. So basically it would have four networks. Um, so you have a Q network uh, and you have a deterministic policy function uh, which maps a state to an action. So, so, you know, these are the two networks, but you also have a target Q network and the target policy network. So these are the delayed copies of these Q network and policy network. Okay, so essentially you have four networks and then in the, so you have two parts, right? You have the Q learning side, which is learning, um, you know, which is learning the Q function, but you also have the policy learning, which is maximizing the action values uh, parameterized um, of the QA. So, so, you know, so let's first see the Q learning side is minimizing the mean squared uh, Bellman error loss. So it is essentially, you can think about this as the Q minus, so Q S A minus R plus some gamma of Q target, right? So instead of using the previous Q, you use the Q network use the Q target, which is you know a delayed version. So it's only slowly update the target network in your algorithm. Okay. So then also interestingly, instead of using the A prime, you would use the mu theta target S prime, which is your policy network, which is also a delayed version of the policy network. Okay. So that's essentially what we're doing in the Q learning side. And then in the policy learning side, you are just maximizing uh, the current one, right? So the current Q network parameter by V and the current policy network parameter by theta. Okay. So you can see the Q learning seems to have some kind of delayed version, which is slowly updated target networks for both the Q network and the policy network. But for the policy learning side, you're just using the most updated ones. Although I don't understand why you know, they do it this way. Like, you know, why in Q learning, they wanted to slowly update, whereas in policy learning, they use the current one. I don't know if anyone has some kind of intuition for this, but this is what the algorithm is doing. <laughs> do you have something to add, Yan Chao? Yeah, for, for the question, I think we use the target networks because in the mean squared Bellman error loss, we have the Q and we have a, a target, which also involves Q. So if you have, uh, if you just use the same network in the two terms and uh, then the bias will be exploded. So they yeah, do the target. Very similar idea in deep Q network where the target is kind of a lazy. So late, you only lazily update the target, meaning like you only update it periodically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would imagine you could also have a double Q network in this scenario. But <laughs> anyway, so okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's continue. So. I really wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the TRPO trust region policy optimization because this algorithm really has some kind of good theoretical properties. So more important, you know, more specifically, it monotonically improved policy with theoretical guarantees. So this seems to be really promising, or at least very like, you know, I would be very excited to see something like that, right? So let's take a closer look at what it is doing. What is TRPO doing? So TRPO is doing a maximization of, again, is an advantage function, but this advantage function is multiplied with a importance weight. What is the importance weight? Is the current pi divided by the old pi, okay? So, so, you know, but you do have a objective function, which is KL divergence between the old pi and the current pi. It's smaller than a delta parameter, like a user defined threshold. So it's unclear at first sight why we do something like this. But, you know, if we go into the slides later on, we'll see why. Basically, people have shown that policy duration, policy gradient, natural policy gradient, 
are special cases of TRPO. So this seems to be a very important framework for us to understand. Okay, so um, Intel has very nicely provided some preliminaries. I guess these are, are something that we already learned, um, but it's nice to go over them very briefly. Again, you have the MDP, you know, as state, state space, action space, transition reward model, row zero and gamma. Okay, yeah. row zero, I think is just the, 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 um, the, the probability of the initial state, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then gamma is the discount factor. So if you have a policy pi, you know, which is a stochastic policy, uh, then it's a mapping from SA to zero one, right? And also you're going to use the eta, uh, my Greek letter pronunciation. This is eta, right? I just wanted to confirm <laughs> it's eta, I think so. Eta pi denote is expected discount um, reward. So again, you know, there is, is very, is, just normal notation. So eta is just the expected discount reward. You can see the expectation over the trajectory uh, following a pi and then summation over the discount factor and the reward at state uh, st, okay? So this is following the, uh, the pi because you can see here, A is gonna be following this policy pi. And this S0 is starting from the initial distribution of the states. Um, of course, st plus one is following the transition probability, the state transition probability, okay? So, you know, then naturally you would have the state action value function q pi and state, fun state value function v pi uh, and the advantage function as we defined before. Okay, so one, really interesting thing about this is if you have the advantage function, this is a really interesting result. Okay, what is this thing? It's saying that if you have a eta pi, so what is eta pi? Is this the expect, so is the accumulated re return, right? So discounted, so let's just say it's return, right? So you have the return from the pi, um, but the, this is the return from the pi tilde. Pi tilde seems to be an either you know an improvement from pi, or you can think about it as something. Um, yeah, so so you know what is this pi eta pi tilde minus eta pi? This is just the difference between these values, right? So it's very natural to see that this is essentially an expectation of the advantage function accumulated. Why? Because for each step, right? So if you're taking advantage function of the, of this, so, Right. So based on the definition of the advantage function, you can see if my AT is chosen according to this pi tilde, right, then this is potentially the value I'm gaining compared with the value of the original pi. Okay, so then naturally, this is the equation where we, um, we, we can see. Does this make sense? Pause for seven seconds for questions. Okay. Don't have a eraser, so I have to do undos. It's kind of annoying. Okay. 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 So if there is no further questions, then we're fine with this equation. So now, with you know, if we are okay with this equation, then you can see for the next for the second term. You can just write it in terms of this, you know, frequency vector. You know, this is just so, 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 sorry. This is the visit frequency for S. So it's the probability of visiting uh, S, and multiplied with the summation of the pi uh, tilde multiplied with a pi, right? 
So this is nothing but expanding out this expectation over pi tilde. Okay, so again, this is um, simple math. But one thing is really interesting to notice is that as long as this term is greater than or equal to zero for every state, then the tilde pi is guaranteed to increase, right? Because it's just the summation over all the states for this term. And this frequency is definitely positive, right? So therefore, as long as this term is greater than or equal to zero for every state, you can guarantee that the pi tilde will improve pi, is an improved version of pi. Its value will be higher. Any, yeah, any questions? Yeah, Yan Chao, do you want to explain this? I think it's, in, uh, it's, in, it's kind of in, important to explain this rho pi tilde s, which is like, you know, it, it includes the discount factor. Yeah, so here, um, so the notation is invented by the paper. So we just um, uh, rearrange the second term, the expectation, and uh, we just um, put the pi tilde and a pi out and uh, just embed all the remaining things into rho. Rho is the discounted, discounted. frequencies. Yeah, yeah. Discounted Maybe it's more, more accurate for, to see uh -huh. discounted visiting frequency, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay, nice clarification. Um, okay, so oh, let's go. So, so the major, so the problem here is that, um, you know, in approximate settings, it's typically unavoidable that for some state, this term is negative. So, so, you know, what they were doing is instead of actually looking at, so let's see, instead of actually looking at eta of pi tilde, what they do is they are actually looking at an approximate, so-called local approximation to eta. So you can see instead of using the discounting visit frequency for pi tilde, you replace that with pi. Okay, so you already know pi because pi is your current estimation or you know, can think about is your current parameterized estimation. So therefore you have a local approximate to the eta of pi tilde, which is L pi pi tilde. Okay, so you can see everything is the same except that you have this approximation, um, you know, you don't know pi tilde, but you, you know the pi, rho pi, okay? So then if we have a differentiable function of pi parameterized by uh, theta, so, so of course, usually you would use omega, but let's just say you're using theta for the parameter that is the same, right? Just a notation difference. So you can see the L pi theta zero, pi theta zero. So, you know, if you are allowing this two thing to be the same. Yeah, so you can see then this means that pi and pi tilde is the same. Then of course is the same because you know then there is no approximation here. So this appro local approximation would just be the eta itself, the value itself, right? Anything unclear? This is a property of this local approximation, of course. It's, uh, easy to see. Okay, so also if you're taking derivative with respect to that and evaluate it as theta zero, then it's also the derivative of the, you know, the true, the actual value evaluated theta zero, right? Based on this, oh, sorry, what happened? Okay, so what this suggests is that a sufficiently small step, pi theta zero,
right? So, so, so basically, a sufficient small, small step of the update from the pi theta zero to pi tilde that improves the pi theta or uh, pi. So, all pi of theta old will also improve the actual value. So this is the intuition why we wanted the step like an update to be small. So as long as your update is very close to theta zero, theta zero is your previous step, let's say, right? So which is the pi here, right? So as long as your pi tilde is very close to pi, then, you know, in, like this improvement according to this local approximation would also improve the actual value. Okay. Is this clear? Of course, this is something very hand wavy is the, like an intuitive understanding doesn't, you know, say any theory about it, but we'll see more like uh, principled analysis later soon. Okay, but this idea is just simple to understand, I believe, for, for intuitive understanding of this. Okay, so you, you, you might now see why, you know, you're in the, in the first slide of the TRPO, we kind of wanted to say there is a constraint of the KL divergence between the pies or uh, between every update is very small. Okay, so now here we have the main result from this TRPO paper. Actually, I don't want to go into the details of the algorithm, but I just wanted to say that the main result is just characterizing the difference between the local approximation and the true value for pi, pi, pi tilde. It says that the difference, so you know, so you can actually find that the actual value is lower bounded by the local approximation minus the KL divergence between these two policy. So what this means is that you are able to quantitatively characterize a lower bound of the true value using a local approximation. And the, you know, and the lower bound depends on the KL divergence between the pi and pi tilde. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say here, nothing more than that. Okay. Is this clear? Okay, so once we see, you know, this is like a characterization of uh, the local approximation, and it seems like, you know, as long as the KL divergence is very small, then the local approximation is a very good characterization of the true value of the pi tilde. Now, the sec so this result is saying that you can have a monotonic improved guarantee. So what is this saying? If you have this mi pi, which is a function of the pi. So mi pi is just looking at the local approximation, right? So it's not looking at a specific pi tilde, but it's for any function pi. So this is like, you know, any pi tilde, but, you know, per, using the pi here. So pi i is the previous uh, estimation of the pi or my current estimation of the pi, you know, which is my current uh, neural network, I guess, during training. But now, you know, I, I just say I define a function, which is essentially the lower bound of my uh, eta pi, right? Right, this would become a lower bound of my eta pi. So we know that eta pi i is equal to mi pi i because, you know, this is, we've already seen that before, right? So this thing is uh, the same. We don't have any update. But we know also that eta pi i minus one is a lower, is, a, you know, is greater than equal to mi pi i minus one for anything else. Okay. So therefore, what, what we can do is, you know, if we wanted to characterize the improvement of my update for the true value, then I can find a lower bound of this improvement through the lower, through the lower bound of, 
of these values. So you can see, you know, I couldn't characterize this, but I will do something like this, right? I will actually making sure that this is greater than zero. Actually, we can do in our algorithm to make sure that m i pi i minus one minus m pi i is greater than zero. So if I can do that, then I can make sure that it's monotonically improvement. Any questions here? So of course, you know, this has to be enforced by your algorithm update. You wanna make sure that this MI, which is calculable, right? You can calculate this MI at lower bound. Therefore, you can make sure that this thing is always greater than or equal to zero. Of course, you don't want it equal to zero. Really, you want it to greater than zero so that you have an improvement. Okay, so that's why this trust region policy optimization could you know, guarantee a monotonic improvement in terms of the values of each update, which is a very nice property in re deep reinforcement learning. Again, I wanted to pause for maybe a, you know, a minute to see if there is any question. Any question? Yin Chao is here ready to answer the questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, Michael has a question. This is only monotonic in expectation, right? Um, yeah, of course, you know, your objective is to improve things in expectation. Yeah. Right, so you know, think about your policy gradient, or you know, is really your objective function is something in uh, in, in expectation, right? Yeah. Uh, what we improve is the uh, eta. Eta is uh, expected. Uh, is the expected discounted return? So is expectation. Yeah. So I think Michael's question goes back to this, you know. Um, the definition of this guy, right? So you can see the definition of L pi is essentially, you can see, you know, in the algorithm, you would have to want to estimate something like L pi, but the L pi is itself an, it's a kind of taken expectation already, right? Of course, you cannot really get the expectation, but you have samples that you can take average over. Does that make sense, Michael? So when you are doing the updates, you are already, you know, looking at some kind of expectation. So therefore, um, you know, as long as you're, ex as long as you've seen a lot of trajectories, uh, it's unlikely that you will get unlucky. You, know, you will have some unlucky samples, but in expectation, uh, there won't be many of them, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is the, you know, I guess the slide for showing you why trust region policy optimization could have a uh, theoretical guarantee monotonic improvement. Um, but this slide is, you know, the so-called main result too. I didn't want to go to the details again, but, you know, this slide is just to show you why it's called trust region <laughs> policy optimization. So, so, you know, first of all, because we wanted to maximize the value of the improved policy, right? So therefore, what you do is, you know, you maximize the parameterization of the policy, which is theta. Usually we will use omega, but in this slide, we're using theta here of the lower bound of the eta. So you can see, uh, let me go back here, right? This is a lower bound of the eta. So we're using this thing. Okay, so this is based on this lower bound. So if you wanted to maximize something, you can maximize its lower bound. Just like in uh, variational inference, you're maximizing a lower bound of the likelihood. Right here, you're maximizing a lower bound of the value. 
for that pi theta. So uh, for, for that pi tilde, which is parameterized by theta. Okay, so, so if you wanted to do that, you know, the practical solution is to use a trust origin constraint. So you have like a trust origin constraint, which is, you know, a kind of threshold, uh, a constraint uh, so that the KL divergence between the old and the uh, current estimation or, or the old one and the updated one being uh, smaller than equal to the threshold to use that. Okay, and of course you can make it uh, a little bit simpler instead of doing the maximization over the states, you could take an average over the states, but this is more details. Uh, I don't want to go into that right now. Anyway, so the major takeaway message is that you wanted to maximize a lower bound of the value instead of the actual value. And you use a trust region constraint to make sure that the KL divergence between the two is smaller than the user defined threshold. Okay. So that's all I wanted to talk about about trust region policy optimization. Um, I don't know if there's any questions related to that. Switch the light on. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so if there is no questions about the TRPO, then we're moving on to Proximo policy optimization, PPO. So, so you know, P TRPO has good theoretical performance, but it's complicated implementation. It requires complicated implementation, also computationally uh, expensive. So the surrogate objective function, uh, you know, the lower bound, which is also people call it a surrogate objective function, is a KL divergence between the old and the new policy. So it's kind of expensive. Um, so what, you know, instead of doing TRPO, PPO proposed a clipped surrogate function, uh, which is a modification of TRPO, I would say, right? So the idea of TRPO's constraint is this allowing the policy to change too much. You know, we, we talked about the motivation of that. Therefore, instead of adding a constraint, T PPO slightly modifies TRPO's object function with a penalty for having a too large policy update. So it's kind of clipping uh, too large updates to a smaller value. I think that's what PPO is doing. Of course, the clipping uh, parameter is also a user defined. Okay, so this seems to be also an empirical kind of modification to TRPO. Is that Any questions? Okay, so Yan Chao had this very nice summary uh, slide about the policy-based methods. You know, we talked about on policy methods, which are simple, inefficient, but the computation are usually, I guess, simpler. Uh, so TRPO, PPO, A3C are all on policy methods. Actually, we'll also talk about the difference between on policy and off policy later on. Um, but the DQN, DDPG are off policy methods. They could be sensitive to hyperparameters, although they're usually more sample efficient. Okay. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Okay, so if not, we'll move on to the third part of the deep reinforcement learning, model-based methods. Actually, I will not talk about specific algorithms for this, but I'll just talk about a general method for doing model-based methods. 
again, thanks to Yan Chao, you know, had this new slides here. So why do we do model based RL, right? So basically, um, you know, the, the question is like, why can human make good decisions? Um, so, you know, because they have the ability to predict. And similarly, if you have a predictive model, so that would be like a model based RL. If you have a predictive model, then you're probably be better at making decisions as an RL agent. So, so, so you know, this is just the motivation why we use model based RL. The advantage of using these models could be, you know, you might be sample efficient. We'll talk about that soon. And you could like reuse the model. And sometimes the models could even be transferred. For example, if you have same, um, you know, dynamic models, transition models, you know, you might be using this between different tasks. So you might be reusing that model you've learned from this task to another task. Um, so, you know, that's, that could be one advantage of it. Also, you know, using these models, you might be able to find better representations. Uh, we, won't, we, won't, we won't talk about details of that, but let's, let's continue to talk about why uh, model-based RL and what's the basic approach of model-based RL. So more specifically, what is a model here in model-based RL, right? So it's different from the traditional model of, I guess, I guess the model is really like abused term in a lot of situations, right? So when you think about models in machine learning, usually it means just something like, you know, you, you model your data through. Um, and, you know, in neural networks model, it just means the network um, in like this deep reinforcement learning for value-based methods, it means just the Q network uh, or, you know, advantage network, um, you know, in uh, policy-based methods, the model could mean the policy network, right? So the model itself is kind of abused term, uh, which is used in a lot of different scenarios. But here, model in the model-based RL basically just means a dynamic model that could predict the next state. So, you know, let's say your model is F. So the F would take input as T and A T, um, and then you would predict the next state. Okay, so usually, you know, for on policy methods, you would just implement A T at S T, and the environment would give you S T plus one. But here, you wanted to use a model to predict the next state. Okay, so of of course, you know, you could, this is just predicting the next state, but you could imagine I can also predict the reward. Um, so for simplicity, um, you know, we can assume that in this lecture, we can assume that reward function is known. And, you know, if we are only, when we say the model, we specifically mean, um, you know, the model predicting the state. But of course you can have a reward model, which is also fine. Okay. so. Once we have the model, you know, we haven't talked about how to learn the model, but once we have the model, what we can do, we can use the model to do something called model predictive control. What does that mean? So think about, you know, when we first talk about reinforcement learning, we talked about if we know the transition model, how do we solve RL? We said dynamic programming, right? Because we would know already how the transition is. So we don't need to observe any data. We can just use dynamic programming, right? We don't need to interact with the environment at all because this is really just a table of uh, Q values that we need to, you know, calculate based on the transition model. So similarly here, you know, if you know already the tr the predicting model of the next state, um, and assuming that is correct, um, and you also know the reward model then you could just do the model predictive control, which is you can calculate the AT all the way through AT plus H minus one, given your model, right? So which would be just the arg max of the accumulated reward. Okay, so you can just use dynamic programming to do that. Okay. So this is the power of the model. 
So now, um, so in this paper, um, the so-called simple framework, it's showing how using a model-based RL could save samples with model learning. Uh, is the model deterministic? Uh, I think usually it's deterministic. If you, once you finish learning a model, it's just a neural network, right? Or it could be a neural network or it could be other things. In uh, yeah, it could be deterministic and it could be stochastic. Uh, for example, if you use stochastic, then your the output of the model is just a, a distribution, for example, a Gaussian distribution. So the output is a distribution and then you sample the next state from the distribution is also okay, De depending on the scenario uh, and applications you use your model. Mm -hmm. You could use a Bayesian network. <laughs> anyway, so, so here, you know, I think this figure is kind of very interesting and intuitive. Uh, first of all, you can see there are three colors here. They have the brown and the blue and the green color. So the brown is like model evaluation. So it's corresponding to this box. And the blue is the world model training corresponding to this box and agent training corresponding to this box. So what this is really saying is that you have an agent evaluating in real world. So this is the only step that you would interact with the environment. What would you do? So you've learned that policy right, from previous iterations, agent training using an R or algorithm, no matter what that is, you've learned a policy, okay? So using the current policy you've learned, you can interact with the environment to accumulate trajectories, observations, right? So you can just do that. And this is the only step that you would interact with the environment. Once you do that, of course, we haven't talked about how, but uh, how many samples you would need, but let's just say you are using the Pi to accumulate the observations. So once you do that, then you switch to the blue box, right? This is how you're doing, right? So using the observations, you would switch to the blue box. What is the blue box doing? Is the world model training. Right, so using the observations that you've accumulated, which are the trajectories, you can learn the world model. So what is it? So in this specific scenario, assume that you know the reward model. So you're just learning the state transition model, right? So given ST and AT, you wanted to learn ST plus one. What is this? This is nothing but a supervised learning, right? So you can just imagine I can minimize the difference between my estimated ST plus one and the actual ST plus one, giving my, you know, given my, um, you know, given my observations, right? And this is, you know, uh, policy independent. Why? Because the environment, you know, if you are going to learn the model of ST AT transitioning to an ST plus one, no matter what AT is, no matter what AT is no matter what, what policy AT is from, you're just learning the transition model. It's really independent of the policy. So therefore, you know, no matter what policy you're learning, you're just gaining some kind of observations to help you learn the transition model, right? So this is the model-based learning. It's a supervised learning, essentially. Does this, is this clear? Okay, so once you learn the world model, what you do is now you can do a RL algorithm to learn the policy, as I said before, right? So for example, here, model predictive control, you can just learn the actions or you know whatever policies based on your model, right? Dynamic programming again. Or maybe you can use other more sophisticated RL algorithms to do that, but the point here is you don't need to interact with the environment, right? You only look at your um, you know, current world model and using your world model, you are just learning a policy that is optimal with respect to this world model. And then you're going to, again, go back to that and using the policy to accumulate observations and then you know, improve your world model 
and then your work model would give you a better policy and so on, right? So you just do this iteratively. Okay, so why would this be helpful, right? So, you know, think about this. This step, you're collecting trajectory from the real environment. And this step, you're just updating the model with collected trajectory. And this step is improving the policy in the learned model. So can you tell me which step is really the samples used? It's this step, right? Updating the model. This is where the samples are used to update the world model. So compared with, let's say, reinforced algorithm, a traditional policy-based uh, policy gradient methods, reinforced. So in this, in this here, I'm just using the trajectories to update my, my world model. Whereas in reinforce, I have to use my trajectories to do what? To do policy improvement, right? So which one is more complicated? Apparently the policy improvement would likely to require more samples. So that's why we're kind of effectively transforming a RL learning problem to a supervised learning problem using a world model. Okay, so does this make sense? So this is why Yan Chao said here that it requires less samples from the environment compared with a traditional policy gradient method. And this is the advantage of model-based learning. Of course, there should be also a disadvantage of model-based learning. Um, you know, the, whatever you're doing here based on the model. So if you have a very bad estimation of the world model, then you, know, you might have a very bad policy. And essentially, if the policy is really bad, then you interact with the environment. And of course, you, know, you might get very bad exploration, right? So of course, it is not always true that model-based methods is more preferred. Um, so I think they have their own pros and cons. Okay. So do we have questions? Yinchao, do you have something to add here? No, okay. it's clear. Okay. Um, so, so let me just do a very brief summary um, of, the re of the deep reinforcement learning, I guess. So, you know, of course we started with neural networks, right? Neural networks are used to approximate the value function or the policy or the model in reinforcement learning, right? So in this model-based RL, so, you know, in value-based RL, you use a network, Q network, right? So deep neural network as a function approximation policy network, which is also a neural network and, you know, a neural network as a model for predicting next state or reward, okay? So really simple modifications or special cases of what we learned about function approximation, okay? So, Basically, if that's the scenario, that's why we started with all these different algorithms in RL. And essentially, any algorithm that is assuming a parametric approximation could be applied with neural network. You can just replace that parameterization form with a neural network. And essentially, that becomes a deep reinforcement learning algorithm, right? So any algorithm that is using a parametric approximation could have its counterpart for deep <laughs> reinforcement learning. Um, so, you know, of course, the NINA versions might not always converge due to some biased estimate and correlated samples as what we've seen in, uh, you know, um, deep Q networks, uh, double deep Q networks, uh, dueling ones and so on, right? So with methods such as prioritized pre replay uh, like what we said, using advantage function as the importance weight or double Q network and dueling Q network, stability can be achieved, but not guaranteed, I have to say, right? Possible that you can achieve a better stability, but you cannot guarantee anything. 
right? So the only theoretical guarantee we can say is the TRPO method, which is the improvement, like a monotonic improvement of value when you do the update. So neural network could also be applied to actor critic methods. You know, we, we talked about actor critic is a, a combination of the value-based and the policy-based methods, right? So you have actor and critic, actor working on the policy improvement, critic working on evaluating the, uh, evaluating the policy, you know, and then estimated Q values. So neural networks could also be applied there. Like I said, actor critic methods is really just a meta algorithm, okay? So using them for model-based methods do not always work due to some kind of compounding errors. We didn't talk about this very details actually. So, but like I said uh, in the previous slide, the disadvantage of the model-based methods could be that, you know, if you have some kind of error, in the world model, then you know the arrow the propagate to your um, planning, and then essentially you would you would get very bad policy, and then your exploration would be potentially very bad. So you would observe bad samples, essentially, right? Not useful samples. Okay, so that's a very brief summarization. But in the end, I wanted to summarize you know, model-free and model-based methods and give you more like uh, clear ideas about, um, you know, how to classify them. So for model-free methods, we have value-based and policy-based, right? So we talked about DQN, double DQ and Rimbo. We didn't talk about Rimbo, it's more like a merge of tricks uh, for deep Q networks. Um, PER, we didn't also talk about it in, retrace, we also didn't have time to talk about that. But policy-based methods, right? So you, you also, sometimes you could also think about actor critic as policy-based because it involves explicitly a policy. So you have A2C, A3C, DDPG, TRPO, PPO, those methods we've mentioned. So for model-based, you know, you can use dynamic models to simulate, use models to initial you could also, so we didn't talk about that, but you could also potentially use the model to initialize model free learners. So this could also be very helpful in terms of improving the sample efficiency. And you could also use models to regularize some learned representation. Again, unfortunately, we didn't have time to talk about that, but so just a brief idea of what model based methods could be used. So finally, the last slide, I wanted to talk about the difference between on policy and off policy methods in deep reinforcement learning. So as we said before, on policy methods include, for example, reinforce A2C, A3C, TRPO, PPO, and off policy methods improve DQN, DDPG, uh, um, SAC, and model-based methods. Usually model-based methods, you would want it to classify as of policy methods. So here are the different frameworks. And let's first look at the left-hand side one, which is on policy methods. So what we do for on policy methods in deep reinforcement learning is you wanted to initialize the policy or the value parameters. So you have an on policy buffer. So, you know, Intel is using D to denote it basically because this is going to be a buffer of the collection of your training data. So what do you do is, why would, why would call it on policy? Because you would actually update the uh, buffer as your learning goes and you would actually clear the buffer after one iteration. So we call that iteration for each iteration, what do you do? You would collect the trajectory. Okay, and you've saved that to your buffer, your data set. And then you update your policy and value parameters using the buffer, right? This is what's in that iteration. You're going to do your update and then you are going to clear it out. So this is why it's called on policy. Okay, so it's like an online kind of learning um, mechanism. Whereas in off policy, what we do is instead of using iterations, we would, we would do steps, 
Okay, so what is the step? The step is just every time step. For every time step, what you do is, again, you would have a buffer D, but instead of clear it out for each iteration, you would accumulate your buffer. What do you do? So for each time step, you would take an action and then you save the current transition to your D. So you're like adding new data to your data set, okay? And then you draw a mini batch randomly. This is, you know, this um, is usually for the data correlation. You don't want it to do, you know, based on step by step, you want it to have a buffer and a kind of sample from that buffer. Therefore, you hopefully don't have highly correlated data examples or data samples, right? So you draw a mini batch from the buffer and then you update your policy and value parameter using the mini batch. Okay, so you never clear it. Right? You might choose you know, to use a mini batch to do the update, or you can choose to use multiple mini batches to do the update. But it's completely up to you and up to your hours. Okay, so is this clear, the difference between on policy and of policy? TRPO <laughs> is TRPO uh, of policy because you use pi zero trajectory to estimate pi. Um, that's a good point. But the thing is, um, we are actually, you know, using the data accumulated from pi zero. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Is that, I think it's a very good question. And Chao, what do you think? I think we are using the trajectories collected by pi zero to improve pi zero to another pi. So it's still on policy, although you can- um, Yeah, but it's also kind of estimating pi. Yeah, it's yeah. It's kind so of it, in the middle. <laughs> yeah, so it is using like important sampling. So it is using off policy evaluation for the new policy, but still you don't use like, um, you don't use the trajectories generated in uh, like in the first iteration to update the current policy. So yeah, yeah but it is a good question. I think yeah, I think <laughs> it is indeed a little bit kind of between the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, you know, by asking that question, uh, you know, it's very clear that you understand TRPO very well. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture. I do have some slides. I don't know if I put that. Um, uh, I do have some, you know, references here that I put. Um, I don't know if I put it in the PDF uh, slides I uploaded. If not, I'll do that soon. So that concludes our lecture for reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning. Um, like I said, I will upload a summarization lecture, a short one soon later on. Um, but if we do have any questions, please, I think this is a good time to ask any questions related to the course, related to RL, deep RL, and so on. Okay. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, I, I guess one is sort of uh, pit, like from Michael's question. I was wondering whether this sort of distributed like asynchronous actor critic could also, like I'm not sure how the different um, agents are learning, how different workers are learning, presumably learning from each other somehow. So I'm wondering if that could also be somehow be seen as a little bit off policy, quote unquote. Mm. Yeah, I think so. My limited understanding of this asynchronous advantage actor critic is, you know, when they were learning it, they were kind of using gradient information from other workers. Um, so, you know, I guess is a little bit, again, in the boundary of how to classify as on policy and off policy. Um, you know, but um, I guess it's collecting the data to learn. 
you know, uh, the network, right? The policy network. So, yeah, I agree. I think there is a subtlety there in terms of, you know, because it's kind of using the information from other workers. Cool. Um, my other question was, I, uh, I guess there were sort of two parts to it, but the big question is like, how do you actually use reinforcement learning in the real world, like not for video games or something where you can just replay episodes again, and again, and again, and sort of related to that is uh, <laughs> like in the real world, you might not be able to observe the whole state. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, in the real world, you might not observe the whole state and PalmDP would be the solution for that. Then there comes the question of how do you learn PalmDP? Um, we didn't talk about it in this class, uh, but you know, I think there is a, so there is actually an inter, I'm biased towards spectral methods. So there is a tensor paper on solving PalmDP if you're interested. Uh, but Yan Chao actually did an internship at uh, a game company last summer so you know your question might be very suitable for her to answer the, the first question you had. <laughs> Yan Chao was doing uh, uh, transfer learning there. Yeah. So in reality, like in especially game applications, it is intrinsically just hard to learn uh, just using the vanilla method we covered it in the course. But we have we do have some other methods, for example. Uh, especially in the case you mentioned, uh, we don't observe the whole state. In that case, typically we use some kind of RN. So we use recursive information from the environment. Basically, you incorporate the history in your state. Uh, so we use like RN or just LSTM uh, to encode your observation. And also some other more like more advanced methods like behavior cloning imitation learning. So you have an expert because they know how to play the game. So you just, um, you just ask some people, uh, you just ask them to play the games for some trajectories. And uh, then they have the trajectories, they collect the trajectories played by human beings and they just uh, make them, uh, they just let the network, net, let the RL agents learn from that expert trajectories. And so we ask the agent to imitate what human beings are doing. So in this case, they will just have a, like a good start. And uh, then we do fine tuning for the, for the trend the policy. And uh, in that case, it already performs better. That answers your question. Yeah, also I guess transfer learning could be useful as well, right? So when you have like, you know, learn from a simpler task, to learn from a more complex task, uh, using yeah. the knowledge you learned from a simpler one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. so in industry, they just use uh, a lot of different implementations, a lot of tricks to make RL work. Although in most cases, or in a lot of cases, RL does not necessarily work. So <laughs> and it's still developing. Very important. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, I think someone's raising their hand. Uh, Valeria, do you have a question? Uh, no, I didn't have a question about the lecture, but I think that we wanted to ask you something about the project. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can talk about that later. Okay, anything else? Or even not related to RL? Okay. 
Well, if there is no more questions, you know, I'll end the lecture here. Of course, this is my office hour. Feel free to feel free to hang out and ask me questions. And I wanted to thank you, Yan Chao, again for joining us for the lecture today. Thank you thank for you. helping thank with you. the slides and thank you for um, you know, helping with the lecture and you know, question answering. Thank you. And thank you everyone for a wonderful semester. You know, I couldn't see you, but I hope to see you in person later when everything is back to normal. And stay safe, everyone. <laughs>